Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the stream. Today's, oh boy, this is all big. Today's stream is on force-free dog training theory from a scientific and legal per perspective. There is direct link to all the notes on this page by going to the URL forcefreedogtraining.info. There is so much to learn about force-free theory and especially why it is becoming a problem in the industry that I believe should definitely be investigated by the Fair Trade Commission. So that's primarily why I am doing this stream, but it will be helpful to anyone new to dog training who is going to be bombarded with information about force-free dog training and is certainly going to be help helpful for owners of dogs who are seeking help and professionals that that basically are damaged um, from being exposed to force-free dog training theory running amok in the industry. So I'm going to present some information, not in any particular order, so that there are facts. Everything that I am telling you are facts and I will be certain to say when something is my opinion. So the information that I have here can be useful to anyone that needs to make a stand, which I have a lot of times in the past about, you know, concerning their business, being in jeopardy because of unfair marketing pro practices from the from force free force free dog training. So here's some here are some objectives. You know, first we're going to talk about is what exactly is force free dog training because a lot of people don't even know. You hear force free, but what what does that even exactly mean? Also, we have to go over which is the inspiration for this post is the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, AVZAB for short. They put out a position statement which shows evidence of support and incompetence and or fraud, which can be very damaging to the ethical to the ethical dog trainer. And it absolutely needs to be addressed. Next is. Um, why is an investigation by the Fair Trade Commission long overdue? And then we're going to go over some of what are unethical and potentially legal cl illegal claims of force-free theory. What are the consequences of force-free advertising? What are some solutions? Why is there hesitancy to adhere to, oh, typo I didn't fix here, truthful, truthful marketing um, um, practices? So let me go through some of this. Lots of information here. I'm going to try it. I'm probably going to cut out some of my notes the best I can because this will go on for a long time. There's just so much information, and I'm hoping that this is a starting point for someone. The first thing that I want to mention here is just a glossary. I'm going to be using terms I don't use lightly. These I go by the basic definitions that I could find in the dictionary and, and none of these terms their their definitions do not really vary much no, no matter where you look them up but i'm going to be making claims of fraud which is a person or thing intended to deceive others typically by unjustifiably claiming or being credited with accomplishments or qualities incompetence inability to do something successfully ineptitude negligence failure to use reasonable care resulting in damage or injury to another um, and obedience, because a lot of this has to do with professionals that are hired to perform obedience, which is why someone pays money to a professional. Obedience is to train a dog to be compliant with an order. or compli this, is, well, this is the definition of obedience. Compliance with an order, request, or law, or submission to another's authority. And 
And synonyms are compliance, conformity, submission, subordination, all right? So, so, so the definition of obedience is, is important because we can't have this definition be altered just because of a certain entity or professional's incompetence where they no longer really teach what would be considered obedience. Um, they teach you know, there may be a company that teaches dogs why it's good to do things and they can get dogs to do things and behaviors in controlled environments, but not necessarily by definition teaching obedience where the dog has to obey, you know, where it was formally trained that there is a sense of authority where they need to be compliant, especially in dangerous situations. Um, Last thing I wanted to put here in our glossary is force, because we're, we're using the word force free. Force is strength or energy as an attribute of physical action or movement, right? So if, if, if unless it is otherwise explained what force free is, we have to assume that force free is that there's absent of any type of strength or energy using being as an, as an attribute any physical action being used as part of the training. So that being said, what is force-free training? I'm going right to, I try to go right to the most respected force-free and oldest force-free training establishments in the industry. So, so one of the references that I, I went to is I searched the Karen Pryor Academy, which uh, you know, this is from their homepage. I got the links all here. A Karen Pryor Academy for training and behavior. We teach effective force-free training in all our courses. Our aim is to build a community of positive reinforcement trainers who share value in collaboration and discussion of training, behavior, science, practices, and related issues. And they also claim on the same page that, um, that whatever this force-free training is, and it seems to be related to positive reinforcement, that the approach is more effective in every meaningful dimension. And that's on our page, right? I'm, I'm taking this, like, I'm, I'm taking this information, like, right, right from their page, all right? It's all, it's, it's all here, all right? It's all, it's all here. Now, also what I did, because I couldn't find much more about the definition, is I went to a website of one of their, one of Karen, someone who's on the faculty, of Karen Pryor, also talking about force free um, over, over here. So she has credentials, training a long time, should understand if she's speaking the, the truth. And so should be accountable and be able to stand by what, you know, what she says. And this particular, this particular person over here might as well Lori, Lori Luck. She says, force-free training is teaching an animal without pain, intimidation, threats, force, or coercion. It's done without corrections, without collars, including those vibrating collars that are used to get your dog's attention and without pain. So she's making it clear it's just nothing that provides movement to your dog, not even a vibration on your dog. Anything like that even to get your dog's attention, it, it's not force free anymore. Once you're doing anything like that. And she also writes on that same page, just to clarify, don't trust that a trainer is force free. Ensure that they are a for, that they are force free. She says, ask questions about what kind of equipment you'll be required to use. Walk away if there is a specific collar that you must use as a slip lead, prong collar, e collar, etc. Find out what happens if your dog doesn't want to work. What will the trainer do to get your dog to listen? So she says, she's asking, what will the trainer do to get your dog to listen? Walk away if the trainer says that won't happen. We'll teach him that he needs to pay attention, etc. So she definitely seems to be adhering to what is you know you know to what you know force free seems to be positive reinforcement based and by definition it seems like punishment is not involved that a force free trainer will not use punishment anything that is aversive that will discourage the dog to do a behavior 
anything that tells the dog that they need to do it, all right? We'll teach him that he needs to pay attention. So right here, she says, if someone says we're teaching the dog that he needs to pay attention, which is done by punishment, um, she says, walk away, all right? So, so it's becoming kind of clear of what force-free training, training is. And I don't know if I'm going to read all my notes here because it just might be, might be too much over here. But this is what I'm going to say. All right. So if we're not doing, if we're only using positive reinforcement in training, positive reinforcement, I want to stress positive reinforcement is a good thing. All right. It is great. I love all trainers, all ethical dog trainers are going to use positive reinforcement. And I adhere to something called Lima. And most ethical dog trainers, they adhere to, um, to guidelines, which is represented Lima, least intrusive, minimally aversive, right? Which means, of course, they are going to use the least amount of aversion and discomfort in their training plans to get what they need from the, um, from the, the dog they're also going to be least intrusive. So what that means is least intrusive means they're going to make also make decisions based on what may be intrusive to the relationship. Meaning if you're doing a training plan and you're not getting good and cert, and it's going to require for you to keep the dog away from you or in a crate or you can't bring the dog in the yard or you have to manage the dog so much that it, it's intrusive to your relationship, the dog cannot be with you that should be a consideration, all right? That's what, that's what Lima is, but it's also, if you can accomplish something with, with the least amount of force, yes, definitely do it, all right? So ethical dog trainers that are in it for the right reason and they're educated, that's what they get paid for. They get paid to, have, to help someone have a relationship with their dog that is not intrusive so they can have the dog with them and they're going to do it with the least amount of aversives necessary, but not necessarily without using aversives or without using punishment. That's really key right over here. And so you can do things, right? Things like Karen Pryor Academy, they do a lot of clicker training and it is amazing for beginner level training. Things like dog sports, tricks, anything where there is a predictable and controlled environment. You can do force-free training. I am a teacher at a career school where I cannot lie and give false information to, to the students in a state-approved curriculum. I teach force-free training there, and they all teach rats in a controlled environment to like play basketball, play soccer, to do fetch, do all kinds of cool tricks, but it is a controlled environment just like a whale at SeaWorld, all right? They, you can, you're controlling when they can eat, you know when they're hungry, there's nowhere else for them to go, you control what's in the environment with them, so you can accomplish a lot of cool things in this environment, but in no way would I promise these students when they're doing training only with positive reinforcement that they can now train that rat when it's out of the box, that it is likely if they stick it outside they stick it in a garbage dump that suddenly they are going to be able to control this rat and have a sense of obedience where the rat knows that it must listen. All right. So that is important. All right. So what happens is when we need to make sure, be aware that anyone claiming to be a force free dog trainer, legally they are being fraudulent if they claim that they are going to train obedience to an animal. Obedience, by definition, requires a sense of authority, submission, that there needs. There is no definition anywhere that you are going to find of obedience that is when is that a behavior that is done simply by choice because you're going to get something good that omits that it must be done, and it's because of sense of, of authority. So any trainer, any person who pays a force-free trainer to do anything that requires obedience, um, that force-free trainer is being fraudulent and can be negligent, all right? Negligent if because of that, 
there is injury or damages because of it, all right? Someone gets, someone hires a force-free trainer because their Great Dane is pulling them. And then after doing some training with the force-free trainer, you get pulled down your steps and you break your arm, right? That is negligent. That is negligence. There is definitely fraud. If only if a force free trainer claims to be able to teach obedience and claims that they can teach obedience better by only using positive reinforcement. Okay. Now, next, I'll skip this because I'm going to get into that anyway. Um, guiding eyes dogs, police dogs, service dogs, dogs with a history or propensity for dangerous behavior. Clients that specifically request obedience training. By law, if you are taking money and someone is paying for control of these type of things because it can potentially cause damages, um, anyone who is force-free trainer should not be taking cases like this, right? They should not be taking cases like this. It is fraud. Now, what else that we have is there's going to be some force-free trainers that say, oh, Karen Pryor does not own the definition of force-free training, and it's going to become more about um, the types of tools that are used, that some tools are considered force-free and others are not considered force-free, which causes something else, which causes another problem. All right. So we're going to have trainers that call themselves force free. And even in there, you're going to have every sort of mix of saying that they're force free, don't use punishment. But then you can see plain as day that they are using punishment in their training or they call themselves force free training, but only say certain tools use force. All right. Or so. Here goes an example, all right? One is the gentle leader. Some trainers call themselves force-free, but then they use a gentle leader, all right? So a gentle leader, and I actually took, this is from a recent video, Karen Pryor Academy. I took a screenshot over here, and I have a link right to the video where they're advertising for their school where they say they do not use punishment at all, but they're using something that they call a gentle leader, which is essentially a head harness, simple, similar to what you would use on, on a horse. Anyone who's watching this video should at least have a basic understanding of operant conditioning, but definitely head halters are a punishment device. They work by adding, that's the positive, um, adding discomfort, right? They move the head, they twist the head, and they put compression along the muzzle. They add something to discourage. Adding to discourage is positive punishment. And then it uses negative reinforcement when the pressure is released, when the dog is no longer, is no longer, no longer pulling. So as you can see over here, oh, there's gonna be a little advertisement. This is Karen Pryor. This is from Karen Pryor's. Own. Teach him to walk nicely on leash and greet guests politely. Learn to recognize when he's stressed and how to make veterans. All right, so this is Karen Pryor's Academy, which we just saw. That's advertising that they do not use any sort of force and it is, and it is uh, superior. Take note of this because we are talking about something here that is potentially um, something that should be addressed by the Fair Trade Commission because we are doing unfair advertising when there are other trainers that refuse to be unethical and lie about what they are doing when they, when they are training. All right. Now here goes, besides that, some trainers that are going to claim that they're not using punishment, you will also see the use of not only like gentle leaders or other halty type of collars, they're also going to use like no pull harnesses which are also aversive, which I am going to show you. Now, um, so I'm going to skim down over here. Let's see. Let's go into, which is really the, um, 
really the main reason was the catalyst why, why I did this video is there's something called the American, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior. So, and what that is, it, it is an organization that comprises of veterinarians that have, that have also studied behavior, but not training. And they put out a position statement and they, they're going to work closely with veterinarians and they're going to work closely with um, how trainers are referred, how, how people find trainers when they go to veterinarians looking for help. Now, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior, they made a position statement that says on their website, and I have links to it, it says, based on scientific evidence, AVZAB recommends that only reward-based training methods are used for all dog training, including the treatment of behavior problems, all right? So basically what they're recommending is that they only recommend dog training where technically you cannot do even true obedience for someone. That does not include in any way teaching a dog responsibility. That's what they're recommending. And also, you got to remember, you go to their site. Let's go to their website here. Uh, let's see, let's click on this. All right. There, you become a member, find a behavior consultant. All right. So they're recommending behavior consultants that are part of their organization that are also going to do training and that are supposed to be following what you see over here. Now, something about the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior. There is no requirement. The members, even though they have to be veterinarians and they have to study behavior, behavior and training is two different things, all right? There is no requirement for dog training education or experience to be a member. There is no further requirement or further educa requirement for further education rather than to pay their dues. One of the benefits of being a member is recommendations for clients from such a prestigious sounding place, all right? Now, why would something, why would an organization like this make such a statement. And now disclaimer, um, everything I'm saying right now is facts. Like these are opinions. Uh, could it be so unqualified veterinarians can compete with ethical dog trainers for, for a market share? Could it happen to be that way? All right. Because how many people are generally going to pay more for a veterinarian to help them with the behavior, which almost always includes some sort of training too. If they're going to pay more, and the veterinarian has no formal education on the mechanics of actually of actual training. Also, I say these. I don't know if that's what it is. I just tried to figure out why. You know, could it possibly be commercially influenced? Now we're going to see in their statement. If you do go to their actual statement, I have the link there. Over here is this the link to their statement? Over here. You're going to see where they recommend, um, um, you know, recommendations that they have. And one of the things that they recommend is that, where, where am I over here, is, is they recommend, um, who qualifies, where am I? Okay, is they, is they recommend, oh, here it goes, bah, sorry. Um, they're recommending trainers with backgrounds in higher level, they're calling this higher level education, such as the Karen Pryor Academy, the Gene Donaldson's Academy of Dog Trainers, involvement in organizations such as the Pet Professional Guild, International Association of, Be of Animal Behavior Consultants, Victoria Stillwell's Academy of Dog Training, fear-free certificates whenever possible. So. Why, you know, why are they recommending these places? You know, you got to follow the money and you got to follow the fraudulent statements, basically, when it, um, when it com comes down to this. Now, all of these places, 
they do not claim at least to teach punishment. You can generally do online programs to get certificates through here. And how easy and convenient is that, all right? Training, if someone is training using punishment, people pay trainers to do high level things that require obedience for things like being able to control an aggressive dog or high level training like service dogs or police dogs or things like that. How convenient is it if you could cut out a big chunk of your education that is very difficult to do, especially without a hands-on apprenticeship or guidance and say, I'm only going to learn the positive reinforcement side of things. And now I got a credential now recommend me because it is somehow, somehow better. Now, keep in mind these behaviorists, they do not have a track record of either at all being competent or possibly fraudulent. I am giving you, I put a link right here to Merck, the Merck Veterinary Manual, which everyone, when I was in school for veterinary science, I had to buy a copy of the Merck Veterinary Manual as a reference. Pretty much every veterinary practice has a Merck Veterinary Manual floating around as, as a reference book. It's a really respected reference book. And in the, the Merck Veterinary Manual and the online edition, you could find a page that's dedicated to behavioral problems um, of, of dogs, which is written by veterinary behaviorists. And without reading the whole thing, I'm just going to show you inconsistencies. And it's either incompetence and or, or fraud. It's one or the other. All right. But it's not either. Of the, it, it, it's, it's definitely one of those that what they recommend is um, when dealing with dogs with behavioral problems, I highlighted, they say positive punishment based techniques should not be used in training because at best they serve only to suppress undesirable behavior and could lead to fear avoidance and even aggression. So even there, they're saying don't use positive punishment based techniques. But then in the same article, they are telling you to, to use um, head harnesses and they're saying that they're effective and, um, um, you know, no pull harnesses and halties over here with the use of management devices such as a head halter or front control harness to ensure safety and success. So they're saying do not use punishment, but they're saying that you do need to use devices which they only work. They're designed to be used by applying punishment. You need those for safety and and, and success. So just to give an idea that this is something that's been going on and going on and going on. But if a trainer sticks to their ethics and claims that they are not a force free trainer, but uses these devices and calls them what they are or use other devices that do not have fluffy names such as like gentle leaders or positively um, positively no pull harness that they are going to be discriminated against, all right? We should expect better competency, all right? Or is this fraud? Whatever the reason, it's, it's not acceptable, all right? So let's review some facts over here. Um, all trainers, this is a fact, all trainers that reflect the standards described by the AVZAB position statement are incompetent at training dogs to be obedient and therefore should not offer this service to paying customers. That is a fact, all right? They are incompetent. They should not be offering a, a service where they are claiming to teach obedience. If a trainer follows these standards, following these standards is hired to train and an owner falls or a dog is hit by a car or is injured, they are considered negligent. The trainer is considered negligent for claiming that they were going to teach obedience and should be liable for damages. Members of the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior 
have a lot of requirements to be part of the organization, but experience and knowledge of the actual mechanics of all common training tools is not one of them. That is a fact. This includes all animals, including even horses, everything. To give an analogy, what they are claiming, if you were to apply it to a horse, they would say they would basically be claiming that a head halter to control a horse is not aversive and it's not being used as it's not being used as punishment and negative reinforcement and that if you only require positive reinforcement and it actually works better then that would be someone would have to ride a horse without the halters without spurs nothing but a stick with a carrot and that would be better that would be better for mounted police officers better for anyone to control the animal that 100% positive reinforcement is the only thing that's necessary and works better according to their analysis of cherry picked of cherry picked studies which we can get into now um the science there is they there are on the on their website all right they point to a bunch of different a bunch of different studies now the studies that we have on their website are studies that are pitting positive positive reinforcement type training versus punishment based training and some of the conclusions they come to is like positive reinforcement training causes less stress on an animal of course all right so that's the thing so that's one of the things why you should use it but this is common sense no one of course positive reinforcement is supposed to be less stressful punishment is supposed to discourage an animal all right the stressful part is part of punishment which is causes them to not want to do it all right so to add an emotional element to it by oh that sounds bad of course it sounds bad that's why an animal is not going to do something and comparing it to positive reinforcement which is good instead of saying which is 100 percent true that using both all right using both is better than using one or the other that is actually truth just like a car you do not talk about the gas pedal is better than the brake and that if you own a car you only need the gas pedal you could do a lot with just the gas pedal and letting go and like rolling but when you need that car to stop you need the gas pedal you need the brake but i guess if i was to pick one or the other i would pick just the gas pedal and go really slow and be careful all right but it's not, they're cherry picking science and making an argument that does not make any sense other than to cause a, um, uh, to cause an unfair marketing environment with fraudulent claims. All right. So they should not be telling us the obvious. All right. There are studies, even though, yes, punishment does cause stress, but there are studies and qualified trainers can read studies on how to use punishment effectively and without stress all right so that's what people learn when they are a professional that's why someone hires a professional to know how to do it the right way in the least aversive and least stressful way stress stressful way stressful way possible all right so you can't get over it. you you cannot you cannot avoid the truth about real science and the four quadrants of operant conditioning and how they work together beautifully for learning to take place. And something like the word abuse is not, is, is, is not a cinnamon for positive punishment or negative reinforcement. Everything could be abused, all right? The use of positive reinforcement um, can be abused. Withholding food that you're going to use for positive reinforcement could be abused to the point where the dog is suffering and always hungry all the time. Of course, all types of punishment, all types of training collars can be abused. So now I'm going to go over some of the schools that they are, that they are recommending. All right. One of them over here 
is Gene Donaldson's school, all right? So I'm gonna show a quick clip over here. Uh, well, before I go over the click, this is from her school's code of conduct, all right? There's, I don't know if I should read it. I'll just read the parts that I highlighted. Our philosophy is that dogs have the right to be trained without aversive stimuli. She also writes, she's making it clear in the school her aversive free training philosophy. She takes money from people saying she's going to teach them how to train with aversive free and saying students, staff and graduates of the academy practice and adore, endorse training, wrangling and behavior modification that does not employ pain, fear, startle, electric shock, intimidation, strangulation or other forms of positive punishment or negative re or negative reinforcement, all right? They're going to do training. She's going to practice and endorse training that has no, no positive punishment or negative reinforcement. That is anything that discourages the dog from doing a behavior on any level, on any level whatsoever. And... She's going to go so far, right? When you watch, when you look up videos of her, she's going to go as far as misrepresenting some training callers. Let's watch this clip. There right are a here. number of different options for stopping your dog from pulling on a leash. Let's get the bad ones over with first. This is a prong collar. If used as directed, the prongs will dig into your dog's neck whenever he tries to pull. It's very painful, and that's why it works. We don't like this. All right. So what she's doing is she runs a school and what she's doing is she's given false information. Any ethical trainer that was formerly trained on how to use a prong collar and why to use a prong collar do not use it in a way where it's designed to be very painful, especially if they are following very common established guidelines of professional dog trainers of being Lima, use being the least aversive as possible. So with things like prong collars, she's misrepresenting, and you have to wait because I'm going to compare it to what she is using, which it, these are, and there's different forms. She's going to use the ugliest one, which is metal. It sure looks ugly, but prong collars, the truth are prong style collars were designed to prevent injury by the way that they are designed is that there's equal force around all areas of the dog's neck and it was meant so that if we're talking about force free it's designed to use less force to be motivational it is meant to be motivational and to be uncomfortable but not to cause a dog pain all right all right no more discomfort than the halties and no pull harnesses that you're going to see that they're going to be used. You could watch. It's easy to look up unedited videos of many trainers using these and they're not using them because they're using them to cause pain or just to dig into their neck. They're using them. These were primarily designed to use less force for an equal amount of motivation compared to if you just had a plain buckle collar on a dog, which would put all the force and more force just on the dog's trachea usually, causing more damages than if you were using a prong style collar, right? So even the metal ones, like they're ugly, but they are designed to do equal amount of force all the way around a dog's neck, not primarily to cause pain. But one thing about a prong collar, for example, is that it's there's no there's no one has ever tried to be deceitful about it. it there's prongs. It's a collar. It's a prong collar. All right. No one was trying to ever deceive anyone. Now, if we go over here, we're going to do the next one over here. That she's showing us. This is a choke collar. If used as directed, when your dog pulls, it strangles him. I remember using this in the 1970s when there were no other motivational options. We don't like this either. Okay, again, 
I'm talking about someone who is a director of a school for dog trainers. There is nowhere, even though I do not use choker collars and um, I prefer to use other type of training devices, I would never... I would never falsely represent how they're supposed to use. If you look at the organizations, for example, I have um, the Guide and Eyes for the Blind um, in, in the city, and they train their dogs with choker collars to teach them responsibility. And any, any reputable place that does decide to use choker collars for their own reasons, where they felt it was gonna be the safest thing to use, in their situation, they do not teach people to strangle the dogs with it. It's usually used to make a quick snap, make a noise, does give the dog a quick, like almost punch on their neck to, to startle them, to give them, to give them positive punishment, but not to strangle, not to strangle the dog. But it is supposed to be aversive, right? It is supposed to be aversive. And a lot of organizations, training organizations, police officers, and things use them. And a lot of the reasons why they're using them compared to other things usually have to do with safety, um, the dog being able to slip out of it, things like that. But it is not, it is not the primary way to use this is not just to strangle the dog. Matter of fact, that is why someone would hire a professional trainer so they can use things correctly and they're not just strangling the dog like she's saying. And the reason is because she she's running she's running a dog training school and falsely making fraudulent claims. Because now when we come over here and we see her doing what we what's considered force free training, what she's using is a gentle leader. Now this is where we get the deception, all right? And this is where it's really legally causing a problem, especially when they are trying to hurt the market for trainers that are not trying to hide anything and being ethical, all right? She claims that she does not use punishment, but here we have the gentle leader. And if you watch, let's see, let's put this, uh, put this on. Here you see her using it on a dog. And in this video over here, which is right on YouTube. All right. For me, it's critical to have the neck strap, strap very snug so that you can have the nose strap loose. That the whole point here is that the nose strap is loose when the dog is not pulling. Because then you get the opportunity of contrast. When the dog uh, misbehaves, it lunges, it barks, it does whatever you, you're, it's going to do that's going to make you um, tighten up. Then there's going to be a contrast. You're going to tighten up and the nose loop is going to press around the dog he's going to feel that um, and then that can be released to... all right so what she's talking about is clearly what's called positive punishment meaning you add something in this case she's adding constriction to the dog's muzzle and it also contorts the neck to discourage the behavior of not sitting or lunging or something like this this is positive punishment, she but she would not she will not say the word. Then when she says the dog obeys and she removes the pressure, what she is talking about is negative reinforcement, all right? Negative reinforcement is when you remove something to encourage a behavior. So the dog is now obeying, she's gonna remove this uncomfortable force that she's putting around the dog's muzzle that she is claiming is different from what you see trainers do when they are using a prong collar or they're using a choke collar. It is just in a different, it's in a different form, all right? They're all punishment devices. Back when the dog is behaving as you right. would like. That's the negative reinforcement. It's the powerful part of the tool. Um, aside from does. the leverage, there's two things. One is the leverage, one is the negative reinforcement. So now when we watch her. Press her off, oh so good. Pressure, sit. My beauty's so excellent. <laughs> Pressure, sit. Once she sits, press her off. Oh, so good. All right. This is positive punishment and negative reinforcement. All right. Jean Donaldson is a fraud. All right. She is a fraud. She's av her her. She's she's doing fraudulent marketing. Um, 
if she's using these devices. Now you can see the same thing. This is one of the other schools. It's Victoria Stillwells. Same thing over here. If we're talking about force free, and this is a still from clip of video I have her training a Great Dane with the same sort of device where it's contorting and there's a high, high possibility for neck injury, definitely force, definitely stress going on. It is definitely in every way that would be considered positive punishment. And you're going to get the same sort of claims about what is abuse, about certain collars are abuse, and other collars just happen to Most not people be who use these kind of things when training have no idea of the psychological negative impact it's having on their dog. Because so many trainers use stuff like this, and so many people validate their use. To me, though, and to thousands of trainers like me, and the best scientists and behaviorists in the United States and around the world, these contraptions are plain abuse. Okay, so, so she's calling things abuse. Um, and also, as you can see, I'll so move over. She's, when she is training, there's definitely positive punishment going on here. There's definitely force. Pull me. I mean... But he just hates it. Look at him. Yeah, well, you have to give a dog time to become accustomed to it. <laughs> Lunging, walking the other direction. Go back. in the other direction he's lunging go back he has a certain right. amount now what we can say not only is there fraudulent fraudulent you know she advertised i mean we'll go into victoria stillwell school over here too um we haven't even gone into hers is in the demonstrations of when some of these trainers are, are using devices, like here at Victoria Stillwell, not only is she using punishment, you cannot even detect any use of positive reinforcement like that they claim that they do. It's purely positive punishment and, neg and negative, negative re reinforcement. Now, um, false statements. All right, that we're going to have over here. I'm sorry, it's a lot of information. I'm not even going to put, there's so much information. I'm just not even going to bother putting it all in the stream. Is um, training collars. She's saying that training collars, certain training collars are abusive and others apparently are not. All right. And this is, I'm going to talk about something else over here. All right, I guess with... Um, Victoria still will have a story, all right? Um, her, I had the pleasure of working with Victoria Stillwell. And not only is it obvious in her, you know, in her, in her, it's very easy to watch the videos and see that there's nothing purely positive or force free about anything that generally goes on. But also, I had personal experience. I have witnesses. I showed a lot of these things. Um, um, in another video where I was asked, I was solicited when she was doing, because since she was a TV actress playing a dog trainer, I was solicited to help out on a TV program for her where she needed to get help with basically a lunging um, canary dog, where I told her this is 100% true. Is when I was approached and I met her, I told her that I know that you advertise purely positive training, but if you want to, if you want me to help you, is I am not a purely positive trainer. I use prong collars, I use e collars, I use halties, I use I use no pull harnesses, I use everything depending on a case by case basis. And what I feel is the least aversive and most humane way to train a dog. She told me, and if Victoria ever, for some reason, 
was to see this. She told me to her face that she has absolutely no problem with any of those training tools as long as someone knows how to use them. She said her problem, which I would agree with this, is that most people do not know how to use them correctly. But, and she also said this, is she cannot ever agree to be in complacent with these with different training tools because she will lose sponsors, all right? Because she will lose sponsors. I helped her with I helped her with her TV show. She could not, and I, I'm not gonna put all the video clips on another video. I helped her by showing her she could not get a cani a canary dog to stop pulling. I showed her how to use a pet safe no pull harness the first time she ever used one and she was so happy because it did not look scary on her TV show. She thanked me. She thanked the other trainer I was working with, Earl Dunn. And she was so happy. She asked me to be one of her recommended positively positive trainers or whatever. And I very politely declined because I didn't think it was ethical. And she was so happy with the positive punishment device that we showed her. She asked us, she, she was so comfortable with us that she asked us to be on the next episode where we were gonna have we were gonna do a demonstration to a child to show them about acting humanely to a dog. So in no way did she think working with me is that I was abusive. Wanted me, it was she said she wouldn't even charge me to be a recommended trainer and use me for her, her next show. But what happened over here is I will show you, all right, is after she shot the show and before the show aired, because it takes months for those shows to air, is she started selling, all right, just a show about fraud, she started to sell an exact replica of the no pull harness that PetSafe made that we had her borrow for the show. And she says, this is on her own website, it's still there, Victoria designed this special no pull harness to help you solve your leash walking problems once and for all by following the positive training methods included with this, with this harness. Now, besides the fact that she, I don't know if you can see, even on the TV show after I showed her, she put the thing on upside down. It's on upside down, even on, even on, even on her website, is it caused chafing, all right? It caused those devices, I stopped using them because if there's any device that I felt was, um, I did not like using, I stopped using. The only training collar that I used even being thoughtful caused an injury on the dog was a no pull harness. The only time ever I had a client get angry at me was when I was first trying out the no pull harnesses. I sent someone home with one and they came back the following week and their dog had um, had chafing and injury underneath their armpits um, for it. Even as I tried to use it, I told her how to fit it correctly as possible. So now we're talking about something that definitely, and I'm going to show how this is used, definitely used as positive, is definitely uses force. It is not like a regular harnesses. Harnesses are designed to be comfortable so a dog can be can pull. These harnesses are designed to be as uncomfortable as possible so a dog will not pull because of force, because of discomfort, and potentially because of pain, depending on how much force is used with these collars. Now again, I'm not against these collars. I am for any training collar that's used thoughtfully and correctly and is the best thing for a particular animal. But what happened is Victoria ended up, because of all the complaints of chafing, she did make a, another pull harness. This one she did design or says she designed it maybe someone else does, which I'll show you in use, which is 100% the most aversive no-pull harness 
that I can find on the market, all right? We're talking about advertising in a school that talks about positive reinforcement and not using aversion. And as you're gonna see in her own video, it is designed to be, it is fraudulent, fraudulent claims. This thing is called the positively no pull harness. It is assumed that people think it's supposed to mean positively reinforcement no pull harness. In actuality, it is definitely a positively punishment no pull harness. It works by using positive punishment. It works by using positive punishment. And just to show you how much of an issue with chafing, all right, any collar could be used incorrectly and a dog can be injured by any training collar, but no pull harnesses is, I put a bunch of links over here. It's just endless. The amount of people that are not bashing a collar are trying to figure out how to use it without it injuring their dog, without the chafing. So what she did is she made a new harness that has velvet that goes on the harness underneath the armpits to help with the rubbing. So there's no chafing. But what she did, I'll show you in the video, is she put, instead of one ring, no pull harnesses work by having a single ring um, in the front of the harness. When the dog pulls, when the dog pulls on the harness, the original ones had a martingale type of system, which would put a little bit of pressure, um, make the harness tighter on the dog to make it secure, and it would actually pull, it would twist their center of gravity off to the side so that they couldn't pull. And would also, which would sometimes cause the chafing, is the strap, which is purposely designed to go right underneath their armpit, pulls out their leg, causing an unnatural, unnatural gait. Now what Victoria Stilwell did in her new design is she put two rings on the front. And in her video, not it's in the video, she says, oh, when there's one in the center, you only pull it so far. And basically she just calls it the effect of the, of the pull harness is not as good. She puts a ring on the far end of the side that she's standing so that she can now pull the dog and there's even more, there's more pull of the strap underneath the dog's arm to move the front leg out of position more and make it uncomfortable and potentially cause injury, especially if we're talking about older dogs, arthritic dogs and stuff like that, which he happens to be using in her, in her demos are these older dogs. And I want to show you, there's something to watch. There's something to pay attention to here. All right. This is a business and a school that one actively, actively promotes saying to stay away from trainers that use punishment and runs a school for dog trainers, claiming she's gonna teach them to not use punishment. Yet, in her video of her product, there is no, there, there is not one in the whole video, you cannot detect one instance where she's using any positive reinforcement at all, but you can see positive punishment and negative reinforcement without even doing with an ethical Lima based trainer would do, which is to first train the dog with positive reinforcement so it knows what to do. Then, yeah, if you're gonna use an aversive like her harness, then use it with the positive reinforcement. But here it is worse. It is the worst type of training that no qualified trainer that follows any compass or any guideline does, which is simply just using punishment when it's completely not necessary. All right, so let's go to a clip here. Let's say positively no pull harness. I'm proud to introduce the newly redesigned positively no chest here Oops. and the reason why I designed it like this is because in other chest led harnesses you normally just have one loop here in the center of the chest however all harnesses will move when the lead is attached 
and you're walking and the dog is pulling. And what tends to happen is that when the dogs pull, the harness naturally comes to the side and pulls that loop to the side. Therefore, you lose that really... Now, what she's not saying is it pulls the loop to the side, but also pulls the front leg out of position. Important no pull action right here. The dog's center of gravity is the chest. And so when you have the loop on the chest, it's harder for the dog to pull. Now, which side to connect? She's connecting this to the far left clip. So she's standing on this dog's right side. She's connecting the leash to the left side. Why? If you walk the dog on your right hand side, then you connect the leash to the furthest right hand loop. So therefore, when you're walking on the dog's right. All right, so now when we watch her walking with this, this is, this is a video on her site to show people without any training how to use her harness. Now, when we demonstrate it, and we're not even, we're not even, she's not even showing this on a beginner dog. Someone who has a dog and needs this harness, they're going to have a dog that's really pulling. So now we have this dog, which now we're going to see this dog, which is first she had it on a very old looking like arthritic dog. Now we have on another fairly calm dog. Now, what she is doing is positive punishment and negative reinforcement. No signs of positive reinforcement. We're not, she's not even praising the dog. She's not even talking to the dog at all besides doing punishment. I'm going to demonstrate walking with my friend Daisy here. And because I'm walking on her right side, she's walking on my left. I've connected the leash to the far left connector point And I've connected the leash, the other end of the leash, to the top Connector. Notice how this dog can barely walk properly with this harness. And this is supposed to be force free behind her leg here. Up. That is not a normal gait for now a dog. Now we're just going for a walk. And, say, and Daisy's a bit of a puller. So um, with this now, she's just getting used to the fact that, oh, I can't pull. If she pulls forward, then I just put a tiny little bit of pressure on my leash and uh, that stops her from moving forward or for pulling me. So now we can just go for a, a nice walk, just um, using the little handle. Let's go. Now you have a nice healing dog. Okay, so like I said, the video is old dog you can see that the dog could barely walk properly with that thing and you could imagine if the dog really pulled you can see what she's explaining to do she's explaining to pull out the leg basically to get it to stop pulling and we're calling it force free we're not calling it positive punishment we're not calling it negative negative re reinforcement at all all right it is it is um it is fraudulent and there's just so much stuff over here. I'm not even going to get into the Pet Professional Guild, which is on the site. It's if you, if you could see what Victoria Stilwell and Jean Donaldson is doing, Professional Guild, Pet Professional Guild is basically the same exact thing. The difference is that it was started by a woman named Nikki Tudge, who had no formal training um, that that's detectable before she started a force-free franchise. Then she created the Pet Professional Guild to support this franchise and also and also created like a like a an education center that it's basically created a network to support force free franchises that are based off of all the same fraudulent information. And these are just these are just some of the organizations that are being recommended to only use trainers that are involved um, in these organizations that only use positive reinforcement, which they definitely do not only use positive reinforcement. All right. So what are some of the solutions? What are the solutions? And anyone who are bared, bared with me, 
Um, um, thank you. Because it's not really easy to get a solution unless people take a stand. And you do have facts on your side. So some of the solutions is as long as there are extremely unqualified professionals to point to, it is easier to continue unethical marketing practices. So I meant for this as a solution is the dog training industry in general is um, they're scared of any type of regulation or licensing. But guess what? The licensing, the, 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 the licensing um, proposals that I have found, they have been written by people who are involved with these organizations. So if you're scared of licensing, yes, you should be if you do not do anything, all right? You do not do anything. It's, it's fraudulent. But there's not only these unqualified individuals that are not trained to use other devices, all right? And I, I'll have references. I'm not going to show, try to prove how these other devices can be used humanely because they can. And there's videos on. There's videos. I'll point them to. It. I can't make a four-hour, a four-hour video. But trainers also have to take a stand. Not only the trainers that do are not qualified to use punishment and choose to just um, make fraudulent claims. You also have to make a stand against trainers who also do not know how to use punishment devices or positive reinforcement or don't understand at dog behavior and take money as professional trainers and make a bad name and give someone for these organizations to point the finger at to say, oh, look, this is why these tools are abusive. Yes. Prong collars, electric collars can be abused and are abused by a lot of trainers because they are not qualified. There's a lot of uncredentialed people that are using these things because the schools that are being rec some of the schools that are being recommended, one, don't teach how to even use them and they're not going to be effective for teaching certain types of dogs, you cannot put a halty collar on a police dog or a guide and eyes dog, all right? You cannot use those things. A no pull harness is, cannot be used for cannot be used for a police dog or halty. You can't use those with a muzzle, you know, for a muzzle. Uh, there's a lot of things that are just not going to be feasible, especially when we're talking about off-leash training and stuff like that, where you need qualified people to do it. As long as there are trainers and franchises that hand people electric collars and say, here, you can run a business. And and they are not very educated, do not understand Lima, do not know how to use positive reinforcement and do everything as least aversive as possible. There's always going to be a lot, a lot of trainers to point to, to say, oh, this is why these tools are abusive. And this is why you don't need punishment and make it very easy for their fraudulent claims to go underneath the radar. That needs to be addressed. There does need to be some sort of standard that is unadulterated. By meaning unadulterated, are there are organizations that do have standards, that do follow, which I'll have a link, Stephen Lindsay's Lima guidelines, which are brilliant and based on science and based, and based on experience. But because these organizations are also have force-free trainers on the committees and stuff like that, what they do is they alter the guidelines to make it sound like um, – um, no pull harnesses and halty collars are basically not punishment devices and they add fraudulent stuff and they make it sound like you cannot use other training collars humanely. All right. Next, we have to teach how to properly use punishment, teach how to properly use punishment rather than falsely say it is not needed in dog training. Demand professionals understand how to use all common training tools. Banning or ostracizing tools does not prevent abuse. You can take away all the e-collars and all the prong collars in the world. You could look at some of the European countries as an example. 
There are videos, I put videos of just, you don't need, they can use their hands. They could use any object that they could put their hand on. They can use their feet. They can use a flat collar and use tremendous force on a dog and use something in an abusive way, meaning it's overused or used incorrectly. It's you do not need banning collars or saying collars are bad does not do anything because everything, including e-collars, are can be used. They're designed. They can be. This is why I need qualification. Yes, they could be used on very hot high levels and scare the dog and be used incorrectly and cause problems worse. Just like you could probably break a dog's neck if you yank on a gentle leader hard enough. But in reality, if someone is using one of these, like I'm using it on myself, it is designed to use, it's flicking my muscle, if it's used correctly, it's designed to be use less physical force for more motivation when needed. Compared to what you see yanking out do old dog's arms or having a dog flail on the end of a collar. And it provides, certain things provide off-leash solutions for things that are just impossible to do with the other collars. But remember, that's why there are professionals. That's why the average person is not probably going to know how to use these things correctly. That's why professionals get hired. That's why you need a professional. You do not hire a professional to be lied to or to give money to someone who cannot even do simple obedience. Scientifically is not even go is either or not going to teach the dog any sort of responsibility whatsoever or they're going to just they're going to say they don't use force and then just use it anyway and say that they're and say that they're not and use something that they're gonna have to use more force to get the same effects from it, all right? They're using more force. Force-free trainers, if they're going to generally get the same kind of control um, with, with, uh, with, from a dog that's someone who's following the principles of Lima and will use all training tools based on what's gonna be the least aversive, force-free trainers will use more force. And all you have to do is study the equipment watch it in use for the same sort of issues, and it's right in front of your eyes, all right? Next thing is a solution. You have to get, I'm putting this out there, is the Fair Trade Commission should get involved at this point, all right? They should be involved in ceasing the claims of these entities, all right? It is causing unfairness in the marketplace, all right? It is causing an unfair market. There are campaigns out there that are making trainers that are ethical, following Lima guidelines, using tools because they truly are the least aversive that are being called abusive on a large scale. Now we even have veterinary organizations right now that are making fraudulent claims the FTC should get involved, all right? This is not only to protect the professional dog trainer, it is to protect the consumer who is being lied to often, all right? And it is common for someone to pay a force-free trainer money to fix a problem and not get results. And every professional trainer out here that follows Lima's guidelines will use aversives correctly Everyone will have their own stories about a client that threw away their money with someone who fraudulently made a claim but would not teach the dog correctly using all four quadrants of operant conditioning that all animals are proven to learn through. Right? Um, next is... If you are part of a professional organization or you are paying money to a university with a trog training degree, a good example is SUNY Cobleskill. They have a four-year degree on dog training and management. They are going to learn real science, all right? All these other schools, they're not accredited. They're, they're not held to any sort of standards. The Victoria, 
the the Jean Donaldson school, that's not accredited by anything, all right? She's allowed to just say whatever she wants. So when now what happens is now you have, you actually do have universities. I teach at a career school and I teach animal training. I cannot lie, all right? Places like universities, like SUNY Cobleskill, when their students graduate with a degree and they are honest, you cannot have... A, an organization like Avzab be putting out statements that will prevent veterinarians from recommending them as a professionals because they are actually going to be truthful and they are going to use punishment when it's necessary and humanely and use guidelines as well as positive reinforcement. All right. The FTC cannot allow this. And some of these bigger organizations, they need to jump on this. All right. Um, so these are some statements you can say to protect yourself, to protect yourself in the marketplace. We, if you train, if you follow Lima guidelines and you use punishment and training and you use any training collar with a base, Lima, if you are following Lima, you automatically, if you're choosing a collar, you are educated and you are using that training collar because it is the best choice for the situation, the least forceful, the least aversive to get the results. And this could be done with different collars in a lot of different situations. These claims are true. I'm sorry, I'm beating this one to death, but I'm hoping someone can use this to create um, legal cases against a force, force free society out there force-free trainers and organizations that to support the claims of Avzab create an unfair marketplace based on fraudulent claims. This is true, prove me wrong. Forestry trainers are fraudulent if they take payment for obedience training and claim that they can be successful with this service. All right, prove me wrong, this is true. Force-free trainers are fraudulent if they claim to be force-free and accept payment, but then use aversive tools such as no-pull harnesses and gentle leaders to administer positive punishment on their training plan, all right? Someone hires, they had all these choices to look up what trainer to choose. It sure sounded nice because force-free said they could give you better results and not use any type of aversive, any type of force. You give them the money and what do they do anyway? They're actually using more force by twisting your dog's head around and um, and and using no pull harnesses, cause, causing chafing, where you could have chose a trainer that does know how to use those, but will also use other ones that may be more averse, less aversive for the job. Victor this is a fact right here. Victoria Stillwell is actively running a fraudulent business in school. I repeat that. Victoria Stillwell is actively running a fraudulent business in school. That is a fact. That is 100% a fact, all right? And she would never, ever be able to claim that I am, that I am slandering her. It's 100% true. Gene Donaldson is actively running a fraudulent business in tr and school. That is a 100% fact that is being left unchecked. The Karen Pryor Academy runs a fraudulent business. Just by looking at their homepage, it's a fraudulent business. That is a fact. Nikki Tudge founded a fraudulent organization. This is a fact, everyone. Any professional dog trainer that claims to be positive only or force-free and claims to teach dogs obedience as a service is a fraud, all right? They can do tricks. They can do sport work. Anything in a controlled environment is okay. But if obedience is one of the things that they serve, control under situations where the person really needs it, they are a fraud. You cannot be a force-free dog trainer and teach obedience at the same time unless you are also being a fraud about using, about either way, if you call yourself a force-free trainer, you're, you're being a fraud, all right? If you're using punishment, you're a fraud for calling yourself a force-free trainer. If you're not using if if you're not using punishment at all, you are fraud by saying that you can do obedience. All right. Why this must be addressed? 
Organizations have been using the fraudulent claims of force-free training to discriminate against ethical dog trainers for many years. Professional dog training schools are taking money from hopeful professional dog trainers without teaching them techniques to be competent in obedience. Many consumers are not protected from incompetent trainers and suffer financial loss and damages as a result. There is a rise of hack training with zero standards that fill that void created by underqualified credentialed credential trainers. All right, let's address that again. Why well, say you need to have standards when the qualified credential standards cannot really teach obedience. Other people fill the void that are not necessarily always qualified to do so. All right, that's what you end up getting. And then we call them hacks. Ethical trainers that generally follow a standard of Lima generally call them hacks. You're generally solving people's problems by giving them, or at least temporarily, by giving quick fix it, stuff like that. And they truly are usually using punishment at much higher levels and often what we be considered abusive levels in some cases when it was not really needed. All right. By not by allowing the force free industry to have to go unchecked. It creates an atmosphere for more abusive, real abusive dog training. All right. Can an individual successfully litigate against a force free entity? I say yes. All right. For the same reason, I'm not going to repeat. Basically, for the same reasons up over there. All right. Did you spend money on one of these places for a, for a business, a force free school, and ultimately you failed or you found yourself having to make excuses and cannot keep clients, clients getting angry at you, wanting their money back, stuff like that? Were you, were you a victim of deceptive marketing? All right. Also, are you a business that is discriminated against because of the fraudulent marketing p practices? Of an of a force free enti entity, all right? It happened to me. It happened to me, all right. Um, further reading. Here goes. I have these these links on here. This is an excellent fact based article by a highly qu highly qualified article, all right. This was written even before the veterinary association over there changed away from even a Lima model. Here's an article over here: purely positive force free in science by Mark Plonsky. Highly, highly, his link is over here on his site. Highly, highly, highly also qualified to write about this. And this was two years ago. And he was addressing the same thing. And it is really overdue. All right. It's really overdue. I'm not going to, this is such a good article. I'm not even going to touch it or try to repeat the stuff that he, you know, that he says in there. Please, if you are serious about this, um, is, 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 is read his article. I have related lectures over here for those. I've been talking about Lima. This is unadulterated Lima, based off of the writing of Stephen of Stephen Lindsay, which does help dog trainers be very successful. If we want, some people want to talk about that it is a it is a dog train that dog training collars in its in themselves are can be referred to. Um, or can be labeled abusive or non-abusive. This video shows this, and it does show how even in countries where they ban certain collars, that they are not in any way reducing the amount of force or abuse that is happening on dogs at all, all right? And if I have been a victim, I have been a victim of um, unethical practices all the time, many, many times in my career by the force free, by the force free community. And if you have been a victim, if you have been a victim of the uh, force free fraud, please open your mouth. If this video is out, put it in the comments somewhere, like spread it. The information that's on here, don't worry about copyright stuff. If you want to go to this web page and copy and paste everything and put it somewhere else, there is take any information that you want from here, all right? But if you were a victim of force before, either as a professional pet owner or business owner, like please let it be, let it be, be known, all right? Let it be known. I have links to everything. I have links to everything in here, all right? Um, so to, to sum up over here is, is, Force-free dog training theory from a scientific and legal perspective 
All the information is here to get the ball rolling for anyone who wants to make a stand, wants to make claims in their own marketing about force-free dog trainers, wants to wants to pursue something legally with litigation or especially a larger organization that really wants to get together and get the the FCI involved the 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 the, the, the FTC involved because it is 100%. This is 100% a case for the Fair Trade Commission and something needs to be done. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for listening. I know it's not the most exciting stream, but I believe it is an important subject.